For those of you who have trouble uh, keeping awake during congressional hearings, let me recommend Zip Fizz.
I call the subcommittee to order. This is our second subcommittee event of 2016 focused on the development of what's of the situation in Turkey. And as we continue to watch with concern, I have titled today's hearing, Turkey's Democratic Decline. Let me say from the offset that uh, our comments and even our criticisms of the Turkish government are predicated on a deep respect for Turkey and the Turkish people. Turkey and America have been and are friends. Friends speak plainly to one another about problems. That's what you will hear today. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my condolences to the families of all the victims of last month's terrorist attack at Istanbul's airport. It was a cowardly attack by radical Muslim extremists, and traveling through that region, I was able to personally pay a tribute to the victims of this horrendous massacre just a few days after the tragic event had occurred. Our expressions reflected those expressions of sorrow expressed and reflected those uh, of the American people. Turkish, Turkish victims are no different than American victims. These people have been murdered in recent months and recent years by radical extremists represent an evil force on this planet that must be defeated and destroyed. And both of our countries, Turkey and the United States, will be a safer people and place when that happens. Those of you who have observed this subcommittee know that while wishing uh, the best for Turkey, we have concerns about actions taken by President Erdogan that may put his people at risk and weaken the strong ties between our countries. Our hope and uh, for, for uh, a better situation and that things would turn around uh, has not happened and we've been disappointed and there's a, a mounting body of evidence suggesting that uh, President Erdogan's uh, uh, party and his regime seems to be involved with corruption and misrule that is taking Turkey in exactly the wrong direction. President Erdogan's party has used the levers of power to limit dissent and to crack down on free journalism. Thousands of judges and prosecutors have been reassigned based on their political inclinations and immunity from parliamentarians have been lifted, opening the way for charges to be used uh, against them in order to sideline opposition, especially those in the HDP. Seemingly erratic, Erwan has officially designated the followers of uh, Mr. Gulam uh, as a terrorist group and this group was once, of course, a linchpin of his political coalition. So he's gone from uh, a, a relationship with a group that has been very important to his success to now declaring them his enemies and declaring him the enemies of his country. Uh, they helped bring him to power and now he has uh, targeted them for repression. These kind of steps have taken Turkey further away from the shared values at the heart of our American-Turkish alliance. While a representative from the Committee to Protect Journalists couldn't be here today in person, they did send a written statement, and I'll be submitting the entire statement for the record. But I wanted to read a short excerpt from it now. The Committee to uh, Protect Journalists reports that over the past two years, the Turkish government, and I quote, increased its repressive action against the press through using vague, broadly worded anti-terrorist laws, bringing charges under an archaic law that carries jail terms for insulting the president, 
replacing the editorial management of opposition media outlets and firing their staff, routinely imposing bans on the reporting of sensitive stories and prosecuting and imprisoning journalists on anti-state charges uh, in retaliation for their work, end of quote. That is indeed a sad description for the state of free media in Turkey. It's a sad description of how Turkey has changed in these last five years and has gone in the wrong direction. While I have always strived to maintain a balanced perspective, it is clear to me that Erdogan's actions have hobbled Turkey's democracy at home and left his country more isolated in the region than at any other time in recent memory. I have many questions for our witnesses today, but I especially look forward to their views on the recent rapprochement between Turkey, Russia, and Israel. While such developments are, of course, welcome, I can't help but wonder if this is uh, merely a momentary change of attitude or something more durable. Uh, we can get into that during the uh, uh, testimony. With that said, I thank our witnesses, and without objection, all members will have uh, uh, at least uh, till this week, end of this week to submit additional writ written questions or extraneous material for the record. I now turn to Mr. Meeks, the ranking member, uh, to uh, have whatever opening statement he would like. Thank you, Chairman Robaca, uh, and thank you for your remarks and organizing today's subcommittee hearing on the political trends in Turkey. As we all know, and as I guess clearly indicated even by the number of individuals that's in this room, Turkey is our, um, is our important ally in an increasingly complex region. And, you know, and I'm grateful, especially grateful for the opportunity to take a look at Turkey again and again and again, uh, because that's how important our relationship is with Turkey. It is, uh, you know, when I first came into Congress and I looked at the number of countries around and the various regions, Turkey is uh, truly an important ally in, in, a, in a country that I think that we've got to uh, work with. And as uh, when you have friends, you should be able to talk honest and open with your friends. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of some of the dialogue that we here, have here in the United States uh, currently that's going on around our country. And the talk is, let's have a dialogue. And dialogue uh, at times has to be frank. So when we look at some of the trends in Turkey, we see that some remain the same since our last hearing. Domestically, President Erdogan continues to enjoy strong support, but has not veered from his push towards a presidential system. The domestic conflict with the Kurds has not abated and is closely linked with the conflict in Syria. And as a result of the Syrian war, the refugee crisis and agreement with the EU has also remained a source of strain. On the other hand, there have been some other changes, some significant. A prime minister resigned in May. Terror attacks have struck the chord of fear, detracting tourists from visiting Turkey and further crippling their economy. These attacks test our resolve, our common values in an open society, and tip the balance between liberty and security. On the international front, Turkey and Israel recently signed a broad agreement to restore ties after a six-year break, a step that I say that I welcome. Furthermore, Turkey is looking to restore relations with Russia, reopening a needed source of tourism. And yesterday, Prime, Mis Prime Minister Yildirim announced efforts to seek normalization with Syria possibly presenting new opportunities for peace building and cooperation. Yet, where does that leave Turkish U.S. and Turkish NATO relations? And what can we do in Congress to make sure Turkey remains an ally and a friend and a trusted partner in the region? I believe it begins and ends with our commitment to our common principles and shared interests. And that brings us back to the democratic space in Turkey. We in Congress are indeed concerned with democratic progress in Turkey. I inquire about its, about its state as a concerned friend. As I said, I want to make sure it is imperative to discuss the recent crackdown on the freedom of speech in Turkish universities and in the press. 
Tolerance in the face of domestic criticism is difficult, and regional events further complicate the situation. But nevertheless, we must fully defend the fight for academic freedom, for freedom of the press, and for the right of individuals to critique their governments. As difficult as that may be to hear, I say that here in the United States, for the people of the United States, and I say that here, there, for the people uh, of Turkey, uh, that they must have the freedom to express themselves. Uh, as we all know too well here in America, suppressing these voices only leads to an erosion of democracy, a hollowing out of society, and even an eruption of conflict. And as the violence spreads across southeastern Turkey and into beautiful Istanbul, uh, we are reminded of the delicate balance between security and liberty. Tragically, these are not isolated incidents. They serve to highlight the need for a path to peace in Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. So I, too, want, as the chairman indicated, send my uh, condolences out to those who suffered losses at the recent attacks at the Turkish airport. We all looked with horroring eyes as terror attacks took place there. And we uh, wish and, and hope that the families uh, know that uh, they are undergoing tremendous loss and pain, and our prayers go up to them and their families. Uh, so I think that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I yield back to you, uh, I hope that this hearing help us to understand and bring a peace that is closer to our reality and helps strengthen our relationship while we have some frank conversation and dialogue. I look forward to listening to the witnesses because your testimony is important to me understanding and learning, and I think that you know those who are listening to this hearing, so that we can get information out, we can share and work together, because the idea here is when we, we, we have to be critical, let's be critical. But it's not just for the sake of being critical, it's for the sake of trying to make sure that we are going to have a better tomorrow and better relationships between our countries, and we can only do that with honest dialogue. And I yield back. Well said. And uh, we, Mr. Trapp, do you have an opening statement? I'd like to thank the chairman and ranking member for holding this timely and important hearing. I'd also like to thank the witnesses for taking time to be here today. It seems like every time we try and hold Turkey accountable for their actions, their response is, but we're a NATO ally. Turkey certainly remains one of our allies, but that does not make them immune to honest and fair criticism. Turkey's insouciance to democracy and human rights under President Erdogan is disturbing. Just a couple days ago, Human Rights Watch reported that the Turkish government is blocking independent investigations into alleged mass abuses against civilians across southeast Turkey. These abuses include heinous crimes like unlawful killings of civilians and mass forced civilian displacement. I also remain concerned about the seizing of various Armenian churches in Turkey, including uh, St. Uh, Gerdoras uh, in April. This is reminiscent of the events that led to the Armenian genocide over 100 years ago. And while I'm discussing the genocide, I'd like to applaud the German parliament for overwhelmingly adopting a resolution calling for the coordinated, calling the coordinated campaign to exterminate the Armenians in 1915 a genocide. All of us on this panel are lucky to be able to express our ideas freely and without fear of repercussions. Ordinary citizens and journalists in Turkey, however, do not have this privilege. Turkey remains one of the worst countries in the world when it comes to freedom of the press, and we got to see that firsthand in April when the president came to Brookings and his security repeatedly harassed, assaulted, and even reportedly tried to throw out media that they did not like. If this is how Erdogan's police act in Washington, one can only imagine how they act in Turkey. Mr. Chairman, Turkey's progress towards democracy is on a downward spiral. They are a country facing a myriad of issues, both domestically and internationally, continuing down this disturbing path when they are denying history, expropriating land, and severely restricting freedom of the speech is not the answer. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gabbard. Do you have uh, an opening statement? Uh, let, <laughs> thank you. let me just note uh, that Tomorrow, uh, I will be submitting a sense of the House resolution based on today's testimony and uh, 
some of the statements that you've heard and working with my colleagues, a sense of the House resolution expressing concern about the direction of uh, uh, and uh, various um, societal trends and governmental trends in Turkey. And uh, so today, I would invite my colleagues to, uh, uh, by the end of this hearing, work with me on developing that particular sense of the House resolution. Uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, thank our witnesses for joining us today. Uh, we have three distinguished witnesses. Uh, Dr. Andre Barkey, who uh, is the Director of Middle East uh, Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center here in Washington. Formerly, he was uh, uh, a professor at, at Lehigh Le University and uh, authored several books on Turkey and Kurdish issues and served as a member of the State Department's policy planning staff. Uh, we have Dr. The, I'm really bad on names. Fazi? Fazi. 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 And Fazi Bilgin. There it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, is the uh, founding president of Rethink Institute, a Washington based think tank. He is an expert in the areas of constitutional and Turkish politics. He received his PhD in political science from the University of Pittsburgh and has taught politics in both the United States and Turkey, in addition to being a published author. And Alan Makoski, Mac Makoski, yes, I remember you, Makoski, I've known that name before, there you go. Uh, a senior fellow at the uh, Center for American Progress, a private think tank in Washington, D.C., and from 2001 to 2013, he served as the senior professional member of staff here in the um, House Committee on Foreign Affairs. And we're just uh, reflecting on how either one of us, uh, neither one of us have changed over those 20 years. Uh, he helped us cover the Middle East and Turkey when he worked for us. And today he's uh, uh, here to, uh, again, give us advice and some direction as to what our policy should be toward this situation now in Turkey. Uh, before, of course, he uh, did all of this, he uh, directed the Washington uh, Institute, uh, Institute's Turkish Research Program and was an employee of the State Department. So uh, we have three expert witnesses, and uh, Dr. Barkey, I would suggest we start with you, and I would request that if we could keep it down to about five minutes, uh, all the rest of your statement will be part of the record for people to read, and if you could keep the... Uh, uh, down to the uh, five minutes, we then could have a dialogue once all the witnesses have, uh, have testified. <coughs> Dr. Barkey. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman Goldbacher, Ranking me uh, Member Meeks, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, it's an honor to te testify today, and I ask that my written testimony be admitted into the record, please. Without um, objection. There is no question that when it comes to issues of free speech, due process, individual and civil rights situation in Turkey has deteriorated significantly over the last three years. The atmosphere created by the ruling Justice and Development Party and President uh, Erdogan is not conducive, conducive to free discussion of ideas, policies, and politics. I will, what I will try and do is uh, give you essentially in bullet, bullet points what has happened and then try to offer you an explanation. First of all, you've, you've all already alluded to the press. The, the, the press is under tremendous pressure. It's a twofold set of uh, sets of pressures. One is that you see journalists being fired, newspapers being closed, um, taken over. Same thing with, with television stations as well as um, f uh, social media. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that there is also uh, simultaneously an attempt to build a parallel, if you want, um, press that is completely, completely subservient to the president and the party. And it's essentially when you look at the, when you look at that press on a daily basis, as I do, all you see is essentially the regurgitation of official um, um, propaganda, if you want. But most importantly, what you see is that there is no room for any discussion or any opposing ideas in that press. So the press is under enormous pressure, and it's not uh, surprising that Freedom House has downgraded Turkey's um, 
status from partially free to not free, which is actually quite damning for a country that is a member of, of the NATO alliance. But the press is not the only one, and this is important to understand. Every institution of, the, of civil society in the state is also under attack with an, with an effort to, to, to dominate. It's true for business associations, it's true for academia. 37 academics have been fired so far, but I, I know a lot of friends of mine who are under investigation and more will be fired as time goes by, eventually to be replaced with people who are uh, more conducive to the official position. Similarly, the judiciary is being, is being revamped and to make it much closer to, to, the, to the government. Even individuals are not um, immune. 1,845 individuals have been um, uh, charged for insulting the president. Some of the, with the penalties are dire. So far, nobody's gone to jail. Um, and even former, former allies of Mr. Erdogan are, are under the similar pressure. So why is this change? I mean, the, the interesting thing is that Mr. Erdogan and his party came to power and in a paradoxical way, it was the biggest and most important opening of the Turkish political system ever, since 1923, I would say. They came against the military, they came against uh, the traditional ruling uh, elites, and for a while they, uh, they, they ruled in that way, but they changed. They changed, I would argue, for two reasons. One is Mr. Erdogan has won victory after victory, and he thinks he, he should be invincible, but most importantly, he actually does feel vulnerable. He feels vulnerable because Turkish civil society is still quite dynamic, can resist, can disagree, and as we saw in elections in 2005, actually defeat Mr. Mr. Erdogan. But Mr. Erdogan is the president, not the prime minister. The prime minister has all the legal powers that, are th that the constitution gives. So he feels vulnerable in, in the presidential palace, so to say. But fundamentally, I would argue, um, the real reason for the change is Mr. Erdogan's decision to not make peace with the Kurdish, um, in, uh, uh, the, the PKK and with the Kurds. In fact, he was making enormous progress in that direction, commendable progress. And he scuppered the peace negotiations after his, um, his own people had signed a document. And the reason he did it, and this also, we won't have time for this, but it explains the changes in foreign policy. The reason he did it is because of the threat he perceives from the Syrian Kurds in Syria as the Syrian Kurds who have aligned themselves with the United States, make progress and move against ISIS. In the process, what he's afraid of is that a, a Syrian Kurdish entity that is closely aligned with the Turkish Kurds will emerge and therefore pose a strategic threat to, to Turkey, and he decided, this is the reason why he decided to essentially go on a rampage against, against the press, against uh, the, the, the Kurds. And in some ways, it also explains the changes that you see today in foreign policy, because as he, as he finds himself uh, isolated, he's, he's, trying to, as he's trying to reconfigure his, his friendships, or so he thinks, with the idea that he will come up with a common shall we say, um, cause against the Kurds. And I'll stop here, the red light's gone on. Okay, Dr. Bilgerman. Mm. Well, uh, Chairman Rarabaker, Ranking Member Meeks, and the members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on Turkey's democratic decline. And I ask that my full written testimony be admitted into the record. It is fair to say that all the major political developments in Turkey in the last five years can be attributed to Recep Tayyip Erdogan's presidentialist aspirations. A de facto Turkish-style presidential system is already in place, where Erdogan appoints and dismisses prime ministers, shapes the cabinet, packs the court and bureaucracy with sworn loyalists. The final step is to be a constitutional amendment that will set the new regime in stone. Freedom of speech and freedom of press is under fire, Thousands of journalists uh, were already fired since 2013. Uh, there is no mainstream media left, uh, only a few daring but small outlets for dissent. Independent media outlets are seized or censured, and social media is routinely blocked. An important casualty of Erdogan's political aspirations and Turkey's democratic decline is the community known as the Gulen or Hizmet Movement. 
The government has targeted the movement, especially since the outbreak of the corruption scandal in Turkey in December 2013. According to Erdogan and his lieutenants, the corruption allegations brought forward uh, were in fact an insidious attempt to topple the AKP government. The cla they claim that this was orchestrated by Gulen movement affiliates nested in the judiciary and police forces. The Gulen movement, on the other hand, has vehemently denied these allegations, calling them baseless accusations serving to cover up the corruption. Uh, the movement essentially is a faith-based network of individuals, organizations, institutions, inspired by the ideas of Turkish Islamic scholar Fethullah Gulen, who is now residing in the United States. It's subscribed to a modern Sufi version of Islam, along with emphasis on interfaith dialogue. In Turkey, the movement established private high schools in every town, most of which became nationally ranked institutions. Graduates of these schools moved on to both the public and private sectors. Many joined the government bureaucracy. The movement also launched influential media outlets in Turkey. Uh, the network showed noticeable efficiency, uh, dynamism, defined the traditionally introverted and subdued culture of Turkish conservatism. However, the, the movement quickly overreached itself in Turkey. The sheer size of the network exposed it to the ill intentions of those who sought influence and leverage. A penchant for high politics in some circles seemingly undermined the message of tolerance and inclusion that characterizes the larger movement. The, the, uh, the media affiliated with the movement, on the other hand, while promoting democratization, demilitarization of politics, and EU membership, alienated the foes of the AKP government, which in better days were, was pursuing those very same objectives. The reputation of the movement media was, uh, were o was also tainted when they underemphasized the irregularities and misconduct during the coup trials several years ago of military officers, journalists, and academics. The movement in Turkey now faces blanket persecution. According to the news, uh, state news agency, as of July 2016, more than 4,000 individuals have been detained and about 1,000 have been sent to jail. The detainees are from all walks of life and include businessmen, doctors, teachers, journalists, academics, philanthropists, and even housewives. In addition, the government is taking over private high schools and colleges and charity organizations that were established by the movement participants. Businesses that have financially supported those initiatives are seized on a daily basis. Many have had to flee the country to avoid detention. The remaining hundreds of thousands of individuals that are ordinary citizens dedicated to education, charity, and service, and unrelated to the so-called political struggle, are awaiting their fate. The movement-affiliated media has been subjected to, to a violent and illegal takeover, including the highly circulated Zaman and Bugün newspapers and several TV stations resulting in the firing of thousands. As an annual report published by the U.S. Department of State attests, Turkish courts have been bowing to political pressure in the last few years. As a result, people in the movement, as well as other dissidents, do not have a chance to stand a fair trial despite very serious accusations leveled against them. Uh, Human Rights Watch stated that the persecutions for membership of an alleged Fethullah Gulen terrorist organization are ongoing, although there is no evidence to date evidence to date that the Gulen movement has engaged in violence or other activities that could reasonably be described as terrorism. But the lack of evidence of criminal activity did not prevent the government from designating the movement as a terrorist organization. This move allows the government to implement harsher anti-terrorism laws for Gulen movement cases. Uh, the Turkish government also continues to harass the movement outside Turkey. The foreign, go foreign governments are pressured to shut down schools and other institutions affiliated with the movement in their countries. The Turkish government has long sought Gulen's extradition to Turkey from the United States. Thus, they, have a they, they launch a litigation campaign against the movement affiliates in the United States. And most recently, a U.S. federal judge dismissed such a lawsuit in Pennsylvania. And uh, thank you. next. <laughs> Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee, it's an honor for me to testify before you today uh, 
as you said in your introduction, uh, I worked here for 12 years as a staffer um, from 2001 to 2013, and knowing the oh, I'm sorry. Now it is. We, you're, you should have known that more than anybody. Yeah, you're, <laughs> I've never been on this <laughs> side of the table before. So <laughs> um, Go right ahead, Alan. I was always a quiet staffer in the past. <laughs> um, anyway, I just want to say, you know, that as a staffer and knowing the great importance accorded hearings such as these, I am deeply privileged to have been invited to testify. I thank you. Um, I respectfully request that my written testimony uh, I submit it be en entered into the record and I would like to join you, Mr. Chairman, in the condolences you offered to the Turkish people on the June 28th uh, attack on the Ataturk airport. The title of this hearing, Turkey's Democratic Decline, sets out the problem. Turkey's democracy, never as good as it should have been, is indeed rapidly deteriorating. On virtually every front, media, judiciary, political governance, Kurdish rights, private business, universities, as my colleagues here have all detailed, freedom is diminishing and power is being concentrated in President Erdogan's hands. Arguably not since the death of Turkey's founder, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, and certainly not since the advent of free elections in Turkey in 1950, has one man held so much power in the Turkish system. President Erdogan's primary focus, perhaps more correctly his obsession these days, is to formalize a presidency-based system in Turkey in place of the longstanding parliamentary system. His second and third ranking priorities, probably in that order, are ridding Turkey of any Gulenist influence, real, influence, real or imagined, and defeating the PKK, and related to that, quashing any Kurdish movement for collective rights. Certainly because of the horrific terrorism staged by ISIS over the past year in Turkey, I have no doubt that fighting ISIS has also become more of a priority for Turkey. And Turkish officials now speak of the importance of fighting ISIS and, PK and the PKK simultaneously. But I don't believe that President Erdogan yet sees ISIS as quite as, as serious a threat to his power and to Turkey as he sees the Gulenists and the PKK. Um, I know there's already a lot of overlap in this testimony and I don't want to do another catalog which of all the human rights abuse. Let me throw out on uh, freedom of the press yet another NGO's uh, report, uh, Reporters Without Borders in its 2016 uh, World Press Freedom Index actually ranks Turkey 151st out of 180 countries, three slots behind Russia, by the way. Um, so it's, it's not a positive record. Uh, another study has said that 70% of the Turkish print media um, and a similar portion of the electronic media is now a mouthpiece of the government, uh, either owned directly or uh, slavishly supportive of the government. Um, I know my time is rapidly diminishing here. So maybe, um, look, I, you know, I'd like to say a little more about uh, what's going on with the Kurds. I think uh, um, Ranking Member Meeks, you very specifically, I think in the last hearing in February, you talked about the, you talked about the importance of dialogue today and you analogized it to the civil rights movement in this country, which I'm certainly old enough to remember um, and to have been a small part of. Um, look, I, I, think, uh, I, I think what's going on, the collective assault, the assault on uh, the Kurds in the Southeast is a terrible mistake. Um, the PKK is not blameless. It was a mistake for them to declare autonomy in various zones, to, uh, to goad the Turks. It was a mistake for them to build up their weapons during the ceasefire. But the response of the Turkish military, I think, is, uh, has really caused tremendous destruction, um, dislocation that at one point was several hundred thousand 
uh, displaced persons within Turkey. It got very little publicity. Um, and, you know, we saw some of the pictures, like from Jizre, that all reminded us of pictures from Kobani. Um, I, again, I don't think the PKK is blameless, but I think w the approach that Turkey has taken is completely wrong and, is make, and has alienated uh, the Kurdish population and made it more difficult to enter into that dialogue that you spoke about. I, in my written testimony, um, I speak uh, uh, a bit about what the future should be of U.S.-Turkish relations. And I don't have time, I don't know if I have time to just quickly list a, a couple of the principles, but... Um, we'll get it in the questions. There you go. Okay, I'll be happy, right. to, I, I'll be happy to end it there. Thank you. All right, that. my first question is, what were you just going to say? <laughs> 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 um, well, look, I think first and foremost, um, Turkey has always been an ally valued for its strategic location. That's been the centerpiece of our relationship. The more pressing our need for access to Turkish bases, most famously Injilik Air Force Base, the greater Turkey's leverage in our bilateral relationship. And of course, when we're fighting a war, as we are now against ISIS, that need for access is quite pressing. It can be tempting, therefore, not to say much publicly about Turkey's democratic shortcomings, out of concern that Ankara's response will be to deny us access. It is important to do our best not to give in to that temptation, lest we appear cynical about our own values and lest we dispirit those many Turks who look to us for support on legitimate issues of freedom. At the same time, when we criticize, we should criticize as a friend, as you said, Mr. Chairman, not as an antagonist. I would say that perhaps we might think of the following principles. First of all, we should be fully supportive of Turkey regarding external threats. I think it was a mistake for us to withdraw patriots uh, from southern Turkey last fall, just as the Russian buildup was starting. Uh, I think we should make more port visits to the, uh, in the Mediterranean, as I've heard from, uh, requested from Turkish officials. Second of all, we should be supportive in principle, as we already are, of Turkey's right to defend itself against the PKK, which is on our terrorism list because it has killed civilians. But the Turkish assault on several cities and towns in its southeast, as I said, has created mass suffering and deep alienation that only complicates Turkey's relations with its Kurdish population in the future. We should speak out strongly against abuses of freedom uh, of the press and politically motivated arrests in Turkey. I know President Obama and Vice President Biden have made important gestures in that regard this year. And fourthly, we should also strongly support the right of the Kurds to cultural freedom and democratic expression. That means speaking out about all Turkish government efforts to quash the Kurdish movement by criminalizing freedom of speech, removing the Kurdish presence in parliament, again, as we've heard already, and by, excuse, and by using excessive force that amounts to collective punishment. And, okay, I, I, I'll just, if I could, Mr. Chairman, just quickly add, I do think we have to prepare for a better day also. I know that NDI and IRI have some important freedom supporting programs in Turkey, and I think it's important that those be supported. Uh, we will note that, that uh, and I think that, it's always important for us when we're dealing with a country that has been such so close to us and such a friend that whenever there are uh, some very noticeable areas of conflict where we disagree now and that it, we're not operating, in, that we make sure we do our very best to confront those issues in a way that will facilitate more friendship rather than driving a country away. And that's hopefully what we're doing today. Uh, wh where, do, uh, where does the panel come down on this, um, the fact that Turkey now has apologized to Russia on the shooting down the plane? Uh, let me just note that I was horrified that they shot the plane down in the first place. And now they're apologizing for it. What's that all about and what's all this about where we have uh, Turkey has made very, um, how do you say, hostile uh, moves towards Israel in the last few years and now it seems to be reaching out to go the opposite direction. 
What's the take of the panel on those two things? Doctor? Well, I would, I would, first of all, I would say that in the Russia case, uh, it was very clear that they had made a huge mistake and they paid a very big price economically with the collapse of tourism. Tourism collapsed because of the violence and the terrorism, but also because the Russians. Um, the deal with Israel is actually most more interesting. I don't think it's a real warming up of relations. It's it's more cosmetic, but but I, but fundam fundamentally, it's a, not about foreign relations or diplomacy, but it's about gas. There's a, the event the Turks want, and Israelis also very much are pushing for a gas pipeline from the Israeli gas fields, which will go through Cyprus and then to, to Europe. And in fact, there's a way in which this is a good, good sign because that means that maybe this, the Cyprus is, there will be a deal on Cyprus, that we're moving towards uh, to Cyprus. But th th the unfortunate aspect of this is that this charm offensive has, uh, especially with Syria now, has another um, downside, it has a major downside to it. And it is possible that he's, Erdogan is going to double down on the PYD in Syria and on the PKK in Turkey in, in a way in which he, Erdogan sees the PYD as essentially the most important threat to Turkey because he thinks because the PYD is a creation of the PKK that you will have essentially a front, uh, a Kurdish front. Paradoxically, the Turks who used to be very opposed to the, to the KRG, to the Iraqi Kurdish movement, are now very close to it. They could have done the same thing with the PYD. The PYD was looking to establish relationship with the Turks. But for Erdogan, he made a strategic decision. And all this charm offensive now, all this uh, moving around, I fear is for a doubling down on the anti-PYD uh, policy. And I think that's gonna be problematic for us given the fact that we have now a relatively robust alliance with the PYD in fighting in against ISIS. And that's the thing we need to watch, I think, much more carefully than anything else, which have immediate repercussions. My time is, is uh, used up now, and we, we will have a second round. Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your uh, testimony. And I just want to and see if I can get some further understanding domestically what's going on. And you're right, as I was trying to identify uh, in the past, talking about some of the lessons learned from us in the United States and what's taking place, it's the prism from which I work. So, for example, when someone tells me that the Turks are trying to pack the court, um, I don't get too upset at that because we're trying to pack the courts here also. You know, that's been the big issue here. Who's going to win this election so that the Supreme Court, it makes a difference. So that I'm not upset about. But I am upset about when there are journalists and others who want to express what their views are and that they are incarcerated as a result of that. And or when there's the big debate, which my question is now, that's being taking place about uh, constitutional reform process, of which I'm not clear on. So I know that there's some renewed... Uh, talks about the constitutional uh, reform process. I know it took place prior in 2012, uh, and it, things broke down. So my question is, where are we now, and what is at stake uh, in regards to this dialogue uh, internally and the prospects for greater instability internally in Turkey, and how does that will that affect us as, as an ally? Uh. Well, let, let me just uh, interject here. Uh, the constitutional reform is uh, it's a, it's kind of like important aspect of the last really, really several years of Turkish politics. As I mentioned, that it's, it's all started with Erdogan's presidentialist aspirations. Uh, technically, uh, nobody, uh, n nobody know or nobody understand why c presidentialism is needed in Turkey. Uh, but uh, the first attempt to reform constitution in 2012 collapsed because of that uh, interjection of presidentialism as an AKP proposal. And, uh, and after that, several other elections that, uh, that AKP and Erdogan won, and now it's on the table again. And uh, what is being uh, uh, demanded or what is being aimed is to build up a regime which is called presidential regime, uh, but uh, in actuality, in actuality is a, is a one-man rule where you know he, 
somebody will be an elected autocrat with unbridled executive power. That's what it will end up with, and that's why it's very controversial. So uh, uh, the the system is parliamentary system at the moment, and normally, uh, as we heard before, the prime minister is the executive, uh, chief executive of the government. But we, uh, I mean, we, there was just a switch of prime ministers last month, and everybody forgot about that already, I think, because everybody knows who's pulling the threats. So, uh, and uh, uh, people are afraid, are concerned that, you know, as Ordon, as powerful as he is now, uh, how is he going to be when he is an elected president with all these powers? Uh, so that is a major concern, and, uh, and the timeline goes, I either we need a, a constitutional amendment in the parliament or a referendum. Well, let, uh, me, let me just ask then, maybe Mr. Barkey, given that, could there be, if you know, there's talk about a constitutional reform process, you know, could it be a fair election? or not. I mean, I've recently just seen that what took place in the UK uh, and whether they're going to, you know, stay into the uh, EU or not. Uh, but that seemed to be an open and a fair election. So are you saying that there cannot be an open and fair expression of the people of Turkey, mm -hmm. that it will be uh, so weighted down because of the heavy handedness of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Erdogan that it won't be transparent and clear? Is that is that My last question on this round then would be, would you say that or uh, is the fact that the outside was going on in Syria, was going on with the PKK, was going on with the PYD, uh, uh, does that have an effect domestically also on whether or not uh, uh, the Turkish people allow, you know, um, uh, well, the authoritarian policies to increase that it seems to be happening uh, now in regards to uh, Mr. Er Erdogan. Well, unquestionably, whenever you have, you can propose the PKK, the Kurdish threat, as an alien threat, and that allows you to clamp down, obviously, on, on, uh, on freedom of speech. Therefore, that affects the elections. I mean, by definition, and if you go to the southeast, I mean, a in, in the Kurdish areas, you have this amazing military presence, you have this amazing uh, oppression that you see. So, yes, I mean, the notion of, plus people have been displaced. If 500,000 people have been displaced, wh where are they going to vote? How are they going to vote? I are they going to be able to vote? What happens to the Syrian refugees? Will they, be able to, will they be able to vote? I mean, there's all these things now going on that has undermined people's confidence in the election pro electoral process. Mr. Trott. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, my questions are to the entire panel, and everyone, anyone can feel free to, to, to uh, opine. I uh, wonder if anyone could give me insight into what the status of the uh, Armenian churches that were seized uh, by the Turkish government and what the status of the churches uh, are at this point. Congressman, the only one that I'm personally familiar with, maybe my colleagues know more, is uh, the one that is located in the Seward District of Diyarbakir, which is right now um, the whole district is essentially closed and no one can have access to the church, and including uh, worshipers. Okay, thank you. Um, with respect to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, so they've been shunned by uh, much of the Middle East, but the uh, uh, president has chosen to, uh, to embrace them. Are they still uh, controlling uh, channels on television? What's the, what's the reason behind that and, uh, and uh, why shouldn't we be concerned by that? 
um, uh, the Muslim Brothers, uh, there was a support for Muslim Brothers. It, it was a part of a general policy of the uh, Turkey's Middle East policy uh, to, to basically support these opposition elements that kind of s similar or look like AKP. And, uh, uh, but now, uh, and, and as you said, Turkey, some, some uh, Ikhwan uh, elements were, were residing in Turkey. And now it seems that Turkey is ready to make a shift again uh, making a peace with General Sisi so that uh, it's likely that they will be kicked out soon out of, uh, I mean, of Turkey. I, I don't think ideologically that Mr. Erdogan has changed his mind about the Muslim Brotherhood. I think mm -hmm. he's very sympathetic to them. He will make, uh, he's a very uh, quick on his feet. I mean, he, he changes policies when they, they th those policies don't work for him and clearly he's decided now a rapprochement with Egypt and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, if with <coughs> Israel, given that Hamas is also part of the, uh, of the Brotherhood, it's convenient for him. But I would say <laughs> that fundamentally, in terms of where his po uh, loyalties and his preferences lie, they are with the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, what, you will s what you will see is probably a set a p a policies of dissimulation rather than real change when it comes to this issue. Just as a historical matter, when the CC uh, takeover happened, um, it was in the middle of major demonstrations going on in Turkey. I think it brought out Erdogan's paranoia, both in terms of his fear that something immediate from these demonstrations might happen and also based on Turkish history, uh, he's al I think he's always been concerned about the possibility of a military coup. And um, so I think that's what it reflected, but I do agree with, uh, uh, with Henri that um, I don't think we're likely to see him change his spots anytime soon. And I, I have to say I'm skeptical that things will move forward on Egypt anytime soon. His foreign minister has talked about it, but Erdogan has made some very strong anti-CC statements after the foreign minister spoke. Thank you. And, and then lastly, with respect to Turkey's priorities in Syria, you know, how do they align with the United States and where do they diverge uh, uh, generally? Well, they have, they at the beginning we were on the same page. We both thought that uh, Assad would leave in six, six months. When that failed and when the opposition failed to, to come up with serious resistance to, uh, uh, to Assad, you saw uh, the Turkey support Jabhat al-Nusra. And this came to in 2013 when uh, President Erdogan visited the White House. He was confronted with that. He was asked to stop supporting Jabhat al-Nusra. The problem is that in the process of supporting Jabhat al-Nusra, a major um, infrastructure of jihadist supporters was created in Turkey who, who funneled people and arms to Jabhat al-Nusra with government support, but also people who went to, to ISIS. But where we are now today, for us, priority number one is ISIS. For Erdogan, it's a PYD, then Assad, and then ISIS. So in that sense, we are comp in there we are, we are not on the same way. He doesn't, see for him, the both the PYD and Assad, even though he's talking about the overtures to, to Assad, are far more important and far more than, than the jihadist threat. I, I think just to elaborate a bit, um, I agree on the divergences. His primary focus is the Syrian Kurds and Assad. Ours is defeating ISIS. Uh, he wouldn't mind if ISIS is defeated in the process, um, but it's not his priority. Um, Second of all, and I think it's the number one issue in U.S.-Turkish relations right now is the fact that we are working closely with the YPG, with the Syrian Kurds, which he considers part of the PKK. Um, and indeed, he has some reason to see their origins in the PKK. Um, and from their point of view, uh, it's U.S. support for a terrorism group. And I have to say, I noticed in a respected Turkish uh, polling uh, company survey this month, the Metropol, 73% of Turks said that the U.S. sides with terrorists against Turkey. It's a very disturbing kind of answer, but I'm certain what it's about is this disagreement about the YPG. Yeah, Con Congressman, despite repeated bombings committed by ISIS uh, in Turkey, 
an enormous threat that is posed by the domestic operatives, which may uh, number to like thou in thousands. Uh, so far, very few ISIS members were arrested, and no one has been convicted out of terrorism or something so far. So this is this is kind of uh, unbelievable, basically, given the fact that you know Turkey has been bombed like one after another. Uh, latest in the Istanbul airport. Maybe Istanbul airport may change the situation. Thank you very much. All right, and now Ms. Gabbard. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Makovsky, your, your last comment about the poll is interesting because uh, as we look at um, Dr. Barkey's comments about Turkey arming and, and directly aiding al-Nusra, which is an al-Qaeda affiliate, this, is, this goes to the crux of the question of our relationship with Turkey as our number one priority is and should be defeating ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and these other jihadist groups. Turkey is directly and has indirectly been supporting them now for years. So f you know, each of you in your opening remarks spoke about um, Turkey's democratic shortcomings, uh, lack of freedom of the press, lack of due process, freedom of speech, um, individual and civil rights violations. We saw in uh, last year uh, how the election went and really how the process was manipulated to benefit Erdogan. Uh, we see a direct contradiction uh, in Syria with Erdogan's continued fixation on getting rid of Assad, uh, bombing the Kurds who have been without dispute our most loyal, uh, dependable partners on the ground fighting against ISIS. Uh, Turkey's actions have directly strengthened groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Al-Nusra. Um, the, the question is, you know, Turkey's a NATO partner and they claim to be an ally. When you look at all of these um, issues, both with democratic values as well as objectives that are directly counterproductive to ours and threaten our security, how can you make the argument um, for NATO, uh, for, for Turkey to maintain its status as an ally. And the follow-up to that is, do you see the current government, do you see a path forward for Turkey being capable of uh, or even interested in changing their policy so that they can actually truly be an ally and a partner? $64,000 question. <laughs> Look, um, it depends a little bit on, on the position we take in, in U.S. government. Look, I spend time in, in U.S. government, I follow c carefully. We tend to always shy away of pushing very hard with the Turks because we're always afraid that, because we have so many issues on a daily basis, Turkish and American bureaucrats talk on a thousand different issues. We're very close allies. It's not, it's, and there is a constituency for this alliance in Turkey. That's, it, the problem I think is that before Erdogan and with Erdogan, we have very rarely stood our line. Let me just say, look at Putin. Not that I want to praise Putin here, but he stood his ground with Erdogan, and then Erdogan had to essentially capitulate. Reminds me what an Arab diplomat told me in Iraq uh, this year, said, we hate what Putin does, but we love the way he does it. Can I just bu ask you a follow-up? You said we have very rarely, if ever, stood our ground right. against Turkey. Right. What What is the source of this great fear that would cause the United States of America to cower in fear uh, and not standing our ground? Well, ver look, we, 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 there's always the basis. There's the NATO relationship. There's the ability of, Tur I mean, th we are too integrated with Turkey. And in general, the bureaucracy, um, is very much afraid. I mean, the decision to the decision to support the Kurds in Syria in, at the time of Kobani was taken by the president against the uh, uh, the opposition of his sta the State Department and White House allies uh, um, aides. Right? They were saying, "Oh, the Turks will be very upset." He did it, and look at the benefits because the Turks were not opening the bases. To, to the U.S. until until then. Once they realized that we were aligning ourselves with the YPG, suddenly they opened the bases. So there's a way in which we can send our gun. I'm not, look, it's Turkey's an ally. Even if Erdogan is problematic, even if there are lots of people in Turkey, who but at the core, this is a long-term relationship which we, which we have not known, known to how to manage well. 
Hello. I think the reason for U.S. reticence is because Turkey is such a strategic uh, ally because of its location. Uh, it is. Um, I think we have been concerned uh, that if we speak out, that we will lose access to it to, to important assets like Interlake Air Force Base. And I think that is what has inhibited us. Just the same way, by the way, the EU is now, which used to be the strongest uh, advocate of human rights in Turkey, has largely been silenced because of its concern about the refugee issue and Turkey's ability to manipulate that. I think we've been, over the years, concerned about Turkey's ability to manipulate our access to what is, after all, its sovereign territory, um, uh, Indrilic Air Force and other places. I Look, I, I think we do have to consider, I hope this is going on somewhere in the government, whether there are other assets in the region that, at least over the long term, uh, could be employed in the way that Indrilic is uh, now, almost solely is in Turkey, and it's so that we could lessen our dependence on Turkey. Um, we, you asked, will they change? I don't think that's the trend. I think the trend is towards greater independence, partly because the, if you look at the whole history of our alliance with Turkey, it has been one of growing Turkish independence. They started off as a very impoverished third world country, and now they are an uh, upper middle income country uh, as classified by the World Bank. Um, so there's been a, a normal trend, whatever the government. Second of all, you have a government which um, is right now, which, uh, which is very critical of us and of the West and um, you know, has shown very uh, anti-U.S. reflexes. I, I don't think we're going to get, um, uh, I, I don't think we're going to see any change under this government. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can we turn the air conditioner down? Can we turn the air conditioner down or on? <laughs> Apparently this is a hot topic, huh? Uh, gosh, where do we start? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Makovsky, is that how you say that? Makovsky. Okay. Alan, Alan will be sufficient. Okay, just call, you, well, you don't care what we call you, just call you for dinner. So you said uh, something about the Syrian, uh, his main concern, Erdogan's, was the Syrian Kurds, and was it ISIL or Assad, you said? Erdogan's main concern. Correct. Erdogan's main concern, I think right now, uh -huh. is the Syrian Kurdish movement. Okay. But closely related to that, it's, uh, it is getting rid of Assad. It is and Assad. Th Assad, yeah. Okay. And that is really run, the Syrian Kurdish problem is something new, but the, our divergence over whether it should be Assad or ISIL as a priority has been going on now for several okay. years. Okay, and then I came in late, so this, some of this may be redundant, forgive me, but uh, one of you said, and I think it was you, that the respectable, a respected polling institution in, in Turkey, was it Metropol? Mm -hmm. um, did a poll and give me the results of that poll again. Yeah, they asked, um, uh, I'm getting this approximately right. In the fight with terrorism, who do Western countries like the U.S. and Germany side with, Turkey or the terrorists? And 73% said, uh, said. This was in Turkey? Yes. Inside Turkey. 73% okay. said that we side, the a West. A everything I'm, the so much of what I'm reading is about how he has done away with opponents, starting with Fatullah Gulen, Gulen and uh, the press, and he's, uh, you know, put a lot of them in prison. He just seems to oppress everybody who disagrees with him. How does this polling organization get to ply its trade without him uh, putting them under his thumb? 
Well, as far as I'm aware, I mean, there are still pockets of independent expression in Turkey. And um, as far as I am aware, these polls are done independently. I could see why you might think okay. from that question that it was manipulated, you, you, but if you went through the whole survey, you might not. Okay, so you, so far you don't believe that they're under his thumb? This particular polling company, I, look, I don't think so because okay. they called the elections uh, essentially correctly. Um, you know, I think they have shown themselves over the years uh, to be essentially over how many over how many years? Well, they've been at it that I've been aware of for at least I think a dozen years. And he has let them continue even that length of time. Yes, I, I I mean people say different things about these polling companies whether they're closer or further to the regime. I people do not currently say that this polling company okay. is close to the regime. Okay, fair enough. And then I think you said uh, in your comments, one of you did. I've been reading through the comments that he probably more closely wanted a uh, Putin-style system. That, that was you, okay. Uh, and then you also said, uh, I think it was Dr. Barkey, that uh, Turkey has been busy, or maybe it was in response to my colleague down on the left of Hawaii, that Turkey has been arming al-Nusra? Was. Was. Mm -hmm. When did that stop? It's not completely clear. I mean, we asked them in 2013 to stop, uh, but it took a while um, for them to stop. But there is a lot of informal networks that are independent of the government that still continue to support both al-Nusra and ISIS. I mean, when you think of the bombing in, in, uh, in Istanbul the other day, it could not have happened if they didn't have domestic help. Right. right. But that's not the government. I mean, that's the networks that were created at some time, uh, at some point with, with the government. But if the government turns a blind eye, he's so busy after right. the, the uh, news stations and the people like uh, Gulen and others, then uh, those who are perpetrating this kind of violence kind of run amok, don't they? Yeah. Um, oh, that's this is a question for all three of you, really. Are there any other countries that you know of, NATO, EU, or, or in the United Nations, who you see this kind of of power grab going on in any other country? <laughs> power grab, in other words, where they're shutting down the press, they're doing away with all the dissidents, they're, they're right. getting their own the, crony. The, unfortunately, the list is quite long. Okay, nothing in the list is quite long of people or countries? Countries. I mean, or, or, or leaders in countries where you see this. You see this same kind of action that you see from Erdogan in other countries, name one. Hungary? Hungary, okay, there's one, name two. Well, Venezuela during Chavez. Venezuela, okay. Still. Now, my, don't, don't miss my question. In the EU, in the UN, or in the, or, or in, um, it was a EU, NATO, EU, or UN, any of those countries? I mean, UN, UN includes everybody. So you can go Zimbabwe, you can go, uh, you know, Ethiopia, you can, you know, there's a whole series of countries. You don't, you're not going to run out of countries. This, this level oh, yes. of corruption. Yes. You, you would equate those. That's interesting. There is, a rising, there is a rising trend of authoritarianism in the world at the moment, too. So okay. that's, that's maybe Mr. Turkey is part of that. Uh, it, it, it extends even to Hungary, which is heart of European Union. So, so, so y'all's testimony today is that you don't put Turkey at the top of that, that you can equate those with other countries. I, I think, uh, Congressman, if I could. Um, yeah, that's a question for all three. Um, I think that reporter without borders ranking that I mentioned is very useful in that regard. There's no other NATO or EU country listed below Turkey. They right. listed them 151st out of the 180. Yeah, three behind Russia. Is that what behind I read? Russia. I came in late, so I didn't hear yes, your that's testimony. that's correct, three behind Russia. Three behind Russia. Yeah, um, so I, I'm not a hung an expert on Hungary. Okay. But the, and no doubt, uh, you know, I've read enough about it to know there are some authoritarian trends going on there. But in Turkey, okay. I think it has reached very severe proportions, particularly recently with, the, with new laws that will increase his power over the judiciary and possibly over private enterprise as well. Okay, and Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time. I'm, if you're in a hurry, I have one other question. Go right ahead. <laughs> Actually, I've got three other questions since you opened the door. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was easy, wasn't he? Um, so there was a 16-year-old, in one of your notes, 16-year-old boy who called him a criminal or something, a, 
a 15 year old boy. A 16 year old called Erdogan a thief and he wound up in jail. What's his status? No. He was released. Um, if I recall correctly, he was never, uh, it never actually came to trial, but I believe he was held in jail for four days. Are you all, the, are the two of you aware of that case? Yes. Am I right, four days? That's what I remember. Mm. Uh, Dr. Other case, I don't know that case, but I know other case. You don't case. know the case. So from what you heard Mr. McCoskey said, is that a travesty? Oh, yeah. I mean, eight, 1,845 people have been prosecuted for insulting the president. 1,845. Now, I also read a quote where, uh, who was it? It was Erdogan said uh, to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation meeting in Istanbul, and you may have quoted this, Mr. McCoskey, so forgive me if it's redundant, he said that Westerners, quote, look like friends, but they want us, speaking about Muslims, dead. They like seeing our children die. Is that on video? Good question. I've not seen it. I read it in the Turkish press, in both Turkish and English. Okay. I quoted the English quote that I used came from the Turkish press, um, the English language Turkish press. Uh, but I, I don't know whether it's okay. on video. And does that could, could I add? Yes, sir. Uh, on the issue of the Article 299, which criminalizes insulting the presidency, I just mm -hmm. thought maybe you, if I could just quickly give you a little context. That is not an Erdogan. That is not an Erdogan creation. That has been there since the mid 1920s. That law. It's been forever in the books. But it does seem Erdogan has used it far more frequently than any other president, and just as a point of comparison, and this is based on another NGO study, his predecessor used it 139 times. His predecessor saved one 26 times. He's been using it on an average of over three times a day through March 1st. All right, that 1845 you. figure was through thank March 1st. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. And that's a Turkish right. government figure. Thank you, I yield All back. All right, is the intended chair to have a second round? And, uh, uh, I will proceed, and let me just note that uh, from what we've heard so far and what we came into this room understanding, uh, there seems to be a, a, uh, uh, a very negative trend going on in Turkey that we have tried, and we've had several hearings. We're trying our best to, uh, to reach out and try to uh, let the people of Turkey know, let the government know that uh, the United States and the people of the United States are grateful for the friendship that they've shown and, and, play, and really are grateful for the role that Turkey has played uh, over these last uh, several decades. Uh, however, that trend is, is very easy to see. There is a cycle of tyranny and a cycle of radicalization that seems to be going on in Turkey. That is frightening about where that could lead. Take a look at what's happened in Pakistan, another country that is strategically located, a friend of ours in the Cold War, and what's happened in Pakistan. I mean, you have a, a vicious uh, radicalization of, of various elements in their society in which you have uh, terrorist, uh, a home base uh, for terrorism, not only in their own country, are they repressing their people and radical Islamists, but also engaging in terrorist acts that might even be traced to the Istanbul airport, for all we know, because they have, a, uh, they have been immersed in this, but yet trying to reach out to Pakistan, we still give aid to Pakistan, even though they're doing this stuff. Uh, so I do not believe that what, what's happening in Turkey is going to lead to a dramatic, you know, uh, uh, a departure of, of, of our relations, but it might evolve into something that's a nightmare, like is what's happened in, in, in Pakistan and our relations today. Uh, let me ask this question of the panel. Does anyone in the panel have any information about or believe that Turkey was involved with taking weapons from Libya and sending them to Syria? Anyone in the panel know anything about that? I'm just probing here. I, I've heard that charge made, but All I right. can't speak. But nobody has any direct uh, information about it. Uh, let me just note that uh, 
we, there are other, uh, it would be a disaster for us to lose uh, Turkey as a military partner, but there are other countries around that have air bases in that region. There's a, I mean, Erbil itself could serve as a, as a base for, for a military operation, so could Kuwait and any number of countries right there could provide what now is provided by Turkey. What, we, what would be bad is to make sure the dynamics that are created by such a large country with, with significant resources and people uh, going in the wrong direction. So with that, let me ask this. And one of the things that I um, uh, find just, uh, it's hard for me to understand this, but it's happened in other countries as well. And that's when you have the president of this country, but now the former the prime minister, now the president, whatever we're gonna call him, uh, his whole political base was established with the Gulan movement. Am I pronouncing it right, Gulan? Uh, the Gulan movement, uh, and as far as I can see, and I've, I've studied what they believe, and I've talked to some people in that movement, they tend to be uh, people who have high values and are looking for a more open and, uh, uh, you say, a tolerant Islam uh, that would be a very uh, admirable type of, uh, it'd be, and by the way, it would be the equivalent of the Rotary Club in the United States. In the sense, you got people who have a philosophy of helping other people who also are politically involved and involved in community efforts to help people. Why, how is it that the Gulan movement now has been declared public enemy number one by the man who they were uh, actually helped put into power and, and over the years have been one of his chief sources of support. How did that come about? Can I, I would like to say something about the Gulen movement. I mean, the Gulen movement, I agree with you, has an image of tolerant Islam. Yes, they were allied with Erdogan. They, they helped, that. They, they staffed the, Erd when Erdogan came to power, he did not have the personnel and it's the, Erd uh, it's the Gulen movement that staffed it. But the Gulen movement um, also was when, he, if you ask the Kurds, the, the Gulen movement was very hard on the Kurds. They, they in, because Gulenist judges and prosecutors unleashed lots and lots of, of uh, cases against Kurds that are still continuing today. There are people who went to prison for nothing. I mean, I just met with one of the most important lawyers in the Albuquerque two, a few weeks ago. He spent four and a half years in jail. You know why? Because uh, um, he was at the demonstration Somebody, 5,000 people behind him opened, uh, opened a flag, a P PKK flag, and the judges and the prosecutors said, oh, you're a member of the PKK because you were standing 5,000 people ahead of you. But is that this the Gulen movement? Or is and that he played, well, th this is why I'm, uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. And he played, if you go and ask the Kurds, the Gulenists were very, very hard on, on, on the Kurdish nationalist movement. There were many ways they were very good. They brought in very good stuff, but on, the, on, on one issue, they were very, very hard. So it's not a completely, uh, we, we have to also acknowledge what was wrong with that. The reason he turned, he turned on them is because, the Gulen, I mean, he thinks that, and this probably enough, he may be right, that the Gulenists actually exposed the corruption. I mean, the people who leaked those tapes of Erdogan uh, and, and the money issues were, he thinks, are Gulenists. And today, the irony, of course, is that when he came to power and he aligned himself with Gulen against the military, today, it's he and the military against Gulen, so the alliances have changed. Um, but this. So the Gulen, Gulen movement it was uh, ended up exposing some of the corruption right. that was part of his. That's own what he thinks. And, and, and it should be it should be added that this is a we are talking about a quite a large network, or was large in Turkey, and uh, it was influential, especially in media. Uh, for example, one of the things that I uh, would like to mention is. Now that uh, Jihan News Agency was seized by the government, we don't have a watchdog to actually follow the elections. That was the only one. That was the only one. Now you're going to learn the election results from state news agency. Whatever number they put up, it's, it would be the number. But it was always checked uh, against uh, Jihan News uh, numbers before. Since it's a large network, as I said, you know, it, uh, it has, because of that, it has uh, usual shortcomings. Like it's a diverse, network, there are nationalists, there are more pious, less pious people, there are more secular, less secular, and, uh, 
and there are people who are just minding their business about like teaching, opening schools, and so on, and there are others who are more interested in politics, right? So it's, it's hard to define where it ends, where it begins, and uh, how a judge or prosecutor is basically considered a part of it while they themselves reject it and so on. So there are all these shortcomings, and I think uh, nobody can really solve that. And, uh, and even the movement itself, the spokespeople and so on, uh, cannot really address some of these questions. So, uh, so but in, in larger, the larger picture, especially outside Turkey or something, the movement is known by it's more like dialogue, you know, activities, education activities or something. And that must, that, that seems to be the core of the movement and movement message rather than what happened in the last few years in Turkey in the political scene. Go right ahead, comment on that. Yeah, sorry, I'll I'll um, uh. let me say two good things about the movement and one questionable. First of all, I've never seen a shred of evidence that they support anything other than peace. Um, so the, the declaration of the Turkish government uh, uh, that the Gulen is a terrorist group is absurd. Second of all, in their schools, they've taught science and mathematics. Um, they've really emphasized what we would think of as more traditionally secular subjects like science and math. Uh, I can't vouch for exactly how they're taught, but I don't know too many Islamic movements in the world that emphasize science and math. That's a real plus. Where I think the failing has been, and you know, again, this is not provable, but I think many followers of Gulen, many Gulenists acknowledge that a significant minority of the police and of the judiciary were Gulenists because they wanted to be part of those organizations and exercise power. And I think there is evidence, circumstantial evidence, uh, that they did act corporately sometimes, and particularly in the anti-military trials uh, uh, that went from 2008 through 2011 with manufactured evidence. And it, it seemed to me from just a distance that uh, uh, the, uh, the Gulenist movement is somewhat like uh, the Masons were uh, uh, in our country's history, back in the founding of our country. They were idealistic people who had an idealistic place philosophy, and, and again, somewhere between the Masons and the Rotary Club, and uh, I think- With schools. <laughs> and uh, just uh, one, last, uh, one last note here about uh, uh, Turkey and uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a closing uh, one-minute statement. Uh, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just good conversation, and, and uh, you know, as I'm listening, I'm just thinking in my head that uh, things are always complicated. And I always try to tell my children sometimes, as we are right now with what's going on in America, try to look at something from somebody else's point of view, turn it around, and I, you know, as I've said in the initial, my initial still really concerned when I see the human rights groups and others denying individuals the opportunity to talk, et cetera. But I think at the same time, I understand that some of the interest that the Turks may have is different than what our interest is uh, because they're in that region. We're not. I also understand the Turks not necessarily just doing exactly what we tell them because it's just in our interest and them not seeing it being in their interest, just as I don't expect someone to tell us to do what's in their interest if it's not in our interest. So that, has to, that happens between countries at times. And so when I listen to you know, the difficulty to the Turks, you know, when you talk about the PKK, you know, they're, to them, they're Daesh. That's their number one terrorist group. Not to us, because they're not to us, but to us, it's those folks in Syria, in Iran, who I call them Daesh because I don't call them an Islamic state. They they're not an Islamic. They don't practice Islam. If you uh, you know if you talk to any Muslim, so there's conflicting interests that are natural, and so I can't see a head of state of a country saying we're going to forget our national interests 
to go with someone else's. So our difficulty is, is trying to figure out how we can bring it together so that both of our interests are taken care of. So what am I asking? I mean, I, and, I, and I go through this with another country all the time, and maybe I'll ask Mr. Mikowski. And we have this dialogue with, with the chairman all the time. The other big country that we've got conflicts with right now says Russia. And Russia has different interests than we do. Russia, though similar to Turkey, had an individual that was the prime minister that decided he wanted to be the president. And all of the power shifted. Russia is not with us. We're not with them when they went into the Ukraine. So the first question is, what is the difference, if there's any, because I'm trying to figure out how to deal with both of these countries, between Russia and Turkey? I think simply put, Turkey is an ally, Russia isn't. Turkey is part of the NATO alliance, and part of that alliance is supposed to be dedicated to freedom and democracy, uh, a key a core of that alliance. Um, Russia is not part of that. If you separate that fact and look at the trends inside those two countries, they become more similar. Uh, and I do, Mr. Erdogan has not spelled out exactly what kind of presidency he has in mind, but I do worry, and I think many people suspect that President Putin is his model. And so uh, you're right, if you look at strictly domestic trends, there are a lot of similarities, but if you look at our responsibility, as is in my humble opinion, Mr. Ranking Member, um, if you look at our responsibility to speak out, it's much greater when we're talking about an ally uh, than when we are not. Anybody differ? Well, uh, I would like to say that the, you know, when we look at the larger picture, the, the political um, system of Turkey and, and, the, and the people, the public opinion, which may be manipulated, but still is, is uh, very much uh, kind of embedded in Western alliance, NATO, uh, and European Union. These are hard facts. These are difficult to change, even for a strong person as Ordan, as he is now, right? So there are two ways to look at this. Uh, Sometimes when I, when I follow the developments in Turkey, I just see symptoms of state tradition in Turkey. State tradition in Turkey is a very powerful tradition, which was never democratic tradition. It's always bureaucratic, always prioritized state over the individual. So that has been going on for hundreds of years. It's not gonna change uh, qu uh, quickly uh, as far as I see. But, uh, but we, can, we can see this, such the anomaly at the moment that we are facing as a, as a, as a phase in, in Turkey's uh, political advancement, or we may see as, as a breaking point. It didn't break yet, okay, but it may break. I think, uh, you know, these next couple of years let or me, so let will let be Let me just ask this then. So what I'm trying to get at, is there a way, just like our priority is to make sure we get rid of Dash? Now, is it such a priority for the Turks that the PKK don't exist? And just as we want to get rid of Daesh, they want to get rid of PKK, they're saying based upon, that's what I'm hearing, based upon the poll that you had, they're saying, well, we want you, United States, to help us get rid of the PKK because they're terrorizing us. And so how do we, I mean, so there's a balance back and forth as opposed to, they're saying, okay, we're allies, but we need you to help to get rid of our terrorists. Now, I'm hearing at another yeah, point yeah. that we need to push back, so we should side with some of those folks that might be against them to shut them up a but little bit. Me, so where do, where, where, where do we get to a balance? Where on the PKK issue. I mean, remember, the difference between Daesh and PKK is in the case of PKK, there's an original sin. The original sin is that you've had a Kurdish problem in Turkey that was unacknowledged, re repressed very, very violently over the years. Nobody talked about it. We never talked about it until the PKK emerged and made it essentially a, an issue. And this, by the way, is, is something that Erdogan recognized. After all, he sat down 
And he had his government sit down with a PKK leader who's in prison in an island in, uh, in Turkey, right? And they negotiated a deal. So he decided to renege on the deal. And, I, and, and we have been his allies in the sense that we've been fighting, you know, we've been helping him on the PKK issue, and we continue to do so. But he essentially reneged on the deal. It's not like Daesh in the sense that he, he made a deal, he, would have, he could have gone ahead and, and finished the deal, and we would not be talking about these prob problems now. He, may, he made his own decision, fair enough. But that's why I say we should be able to push back and maybe nego and help maybe uh, in be an intermediary. We can push back. The important thing to understand about Turkey, though, I mean, this is from the tone of the hearing. Look, this is a country that is very divided at the moment. And it's a country where you still have, despite all the pressure, a very um, a, a civil society that is pushing back, that's fighting back. Mm -hmm. that's th those are our allies, right? And but these are all the countries are very divided. The United States is I very know. divided. I know, but what I'm trying to say, you know, the impression that you get, we're getting here is that Erdogan has complete control, and I'm saying he, had, he doesn't have complete control yet. So the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is we don't, we don't have a substitute. Kuwait and Erbil are not a substitute, uh, Congressman Robaha, to, to Turkey. I mean, we are, Turkey is embedded in NATO. Nobody else is going to replace Turkey in, from, that yeah, that uh, from that perspective. Right? So, but we, we have allies in Turkey that we can work with, even I, if I don't, it's problematic. But we need to hold, we need to hold to our principles and to our policies when it, we deal with Erdogan. Similar to we should do in Russia. I mean, Absolutely. That's, they are two big Absolutely. countries that are important Absolutely. that we can't ignore. Absolutely. We can't ignore Russia. We can't ignore Turkey. Right. That's my point. The, bal like the balance is very difficult, but you're absolutely right. It has to be a cornerstone principle of ours that we oppose the use of violence for political ends. So we are correct absolutely. to oppose the PKK in that regard. But I think we do have to acknowledge that Erdogan at first, uh, not at first, Erdogan came around to negotiating with the PKK. Uh, indirectly, but almost directly. Um, and he seemed to be the one that reneged on the deal. That doesn't justify the use of violence, not at all. But I think that context is very important. And I just maybe, if I could add, why did he renege on the deal? In my view, um, the emergence of a Kurdish political party that opposed his presidency plan, I think infuriated him. Just like he felt spurned by the Gulenists, he felt spurned by the Kurds, who he felt had reason to be grateful to him, and in fact, made some very important gains under him. I visited Diyarbakir uh, several times last year, but I had not been there for 15 years until then. And the gains were, this was before the fighting broke out, when my first visit, the gains were immense. He felt they owed him gratitude. I think when this party emerged, uh, that contrary to his expectations, opposed his presidency ideas rather than supported it, I think uh, he decided to unleash the fury. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses. I, I'll just have a very short observation, which is, of course, the prerogative of the I'll chair. <laughs> but would you like to have a, a final uh, one? Well, I'll, I'll ahead. Again, just thanking you. Um, uh, very insightful. Uh, and I thank the chair for having this hearing. I think that in the next few months we should have another one. Uh, and hopefully uh, in January, uh, when I'm the chair, we'll have another one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll be the ranking member. What? <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to thank you very much because. You know, the, this kind of dialogue is tremendously important uh, for us to air out, for us to think about uh, as we move forward. You know, this stuff is not easy. It's, it's not simple. It's complicated. And, um, you know, as many people as I talk to about one, you know, they, one side, they're on one side or the other, very similar to here in the United States. If you come and you just went to one particular state, you'd think that the United States is all one way, then you talk to someone else and you say, oh, no, it's another way. And this kind of dialogue is very helpful. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that this, commi this committee and the hearing is very timely and very important to uh, uh, looking at what we're doing on the Foreign Affairs Committee and Foreign Policy.
Yes, I think uh, Mr. Meeks and I have a, a very good relationship, and, and I think it's an exemplary of uh, our Foreign Affairs Committee and that we uh, are able to do things. And I would remind uh, uh, Mr. Meeks and uh, other members that we will be trying to put together a, uh, a sense of the House resolution expressing concerns over the trends in Turkey. Not condemnations, but expressing concerns over the trends in Turkey. Uh, I, uh, I would hope that uh, we, we are, we have to talk within the, <laughs> and, and, and when we're analyzing Turkey, we have to do it within the context of what is going on in the bigger picture. And what's, the EU is falling apart. I mean, think about this. I mean, uh, uh, Britain's exit of the EU, uh, this, this is a first huge step, as huge as someone else would say who may end up president. <laughs> and uh, so we've got some changes. And of course, uh, in our lifetime, uh, Turkey was constantly trying to become part of the EU and part of the common market. And now I ex think that's probably history. And I think that uh, uh, Erdogan represents a more of a nationalistic, uh, Turkey-focused rather than Europe-focused approach. So these are all major changes that are going on. And let us hope that as uh, uh, these changes happen, I uh, believe that NATO, uh, when we have, if, we, if we have a new president, if it's uh, Mr. Trump, I would expect that NATO and the EU alliances will become less important and that individual deals and relationships uh, between countries respecting that each country has its own interests at stake but trying to find a common ground where people can act together, that will replace some of the more uh, systematized approaches that we've had uh, since the uh, beginning of the Cold War, and the Cold War is over. So with that said, uh, whatever emerges in this new era that we're putting in, Turkey will play a very significant role. It's right there in the middle of everything. So uh, uh, we take it very seriously. We respect the people there. Uh, we are concerned that uh, it's trend line. And by the way, just one last note. Uh, it has been my experience that whenever the suppression of the press goes up, the level of corruption rises at the same rate. And uh, if we have a suppression of, of, of various political elements in society in Turkey, and we have a suppression of freedom of the press, you can expect that there will be corruption as a result, and it will, but, and it will not bode well for the people of Turkey. Well, we're on their side, and uh, I now hold this committee adjourned.